Welcome to Research Perch from the Massage Therapy Foundation. Short, practical insights into massage therapy research and how it can benefit your practice. Hey everyone, welcome back to Research Perch. Happy New Year, New Year, new episodes of Research Perch. I uh, appreciate you joining us after our holiday hiatus, so welcome back. Uh, here as always with uh, Nikki Monk and Ruth Werner. I'm Michael Reynolds, your host and chair of the Marketing Committee for the Massage Therapy Foundation. Um, so Nikki, how are you? Joining us from your office in Indianapolis, right? I'm doing great other than the sub-zero temperatures. I know, it's like a thousand degrees below zero in Indy, so uh, Ruth was rubbing it in that she is, uh, like, what, mid-50s, sunny, is that, where, uh, is that your weather today? In yeah, Oregon? that's pretty much it, mid-50s, sunny, tropical blue outside, it's fantastic. It's well, sunny and green here. <laughs> Just lots of snow on the ground and lots of wind, that's very cold. Well, you're welcome to feel sorry for us today, Nick, or, uh, Ruth, so uh, enjoy the sunshine. Um, so, like I said, welcome back. As our listeners know and our uh, viewers know, Research Perch is here to help you unpack articles from the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work, which is at IJTMB.org. Um, and there is a lot of great information on that site pertaining to uh, research in massage therapy. So, uh, we've got a great uh, article today to focus on. And the title of that article is The Effects of Massage Therapy on Pain Management in the Acute Care Setting. Uh, Love this one. It was actually very uh, interesting to me. A lot of stuff was, um, you know, stuff that I am not shocked to see. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I think we can dig into here to kind of see how we can, um, or what we can learn from it. So uh, who'd like to start off and kind of set the stage on this one? Bruce, do you want to talk about the, the premise of it? Well, I can talk about it a little bit. Um, uh, and I'll come at it from the perspective of, of seeing some changes in our profession in the past you know, several years. Um, there's been increasing interest in the, uh, in the effectiveness of massage therapy in hospital settings. Um, and there have been small-scale feasibility studies um, looking at massage in uh, the ICU and in post-cardiac surgery and in a few other places. We've seen some small-scale studies, a lot of them coming out of the Mayo Clinic. Um, and the results typically are really positive, and the feasibility aspects of it have also been reasonably positive. It's really an issue of, of uh, pr the practicality of whether this can you know, be managed amidst all the other kind of care that people are receiving. Um, but this is probably the first one that I've looked at about uh, massage therapy in an acute care setting that is not, you know, that's really looking at the patients more than at the, the um, mechanics of bringing massage therapy, you know, into a hospital. Um, and so while the results might, you know, of, of having people have some improvement in their pain and in their stress levels um, might be a little bit self-evident. It's, it's one of the larger scale studies we've seen that really looks at this question. And what do we mean by acute care setting exactly? You want to take that one, Nikki? Sure, sure. Okay, so in acute care, this would be um, inpatient uh, people who are admitted into the hospital. Okay. And so with this, with this group, they were actually looking at um, uh, three populations of folks who were admitted into the hospital. Those who were, in, and I'm not looking at it right now, so Ruth, correct me if, if I've oh, got well. these wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. One, the um, OB uh, folks, and, oh shoot, what were the other two? I don't know, it should just be. Oh, on the medical, medical and surgical. Um, so medical inpatients, surgical inpatients, and then um, obstetrics inpatients. Okay. The three different categories. And something else that I think is uh, really important to set up with this as well is that these were, uh, this was a study that was, the massage therapists were really involved. These were licensed practitioners in the state of Arizona, and in fact, this was a study that was done in Flagstaff, which I really appreciate because that's where I just came from, from my holiday travels. Um, <laughs> and, and in fact, the two, two of the three massage therapists who provided all the treatments in this study were authors on the paper, which is really nice to see as well. In fact, one of them was the first author. And um, I would assume that Cynthia Beckett was one of the uh, primary investigators. She's the, she's the uh, senior author there at the end. And she's an RN there in the uh, OB mm. department. So, so th th there's a really long description of what acute care setting is there, Michael. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. More information is better. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So this was this is a descriptive study, and I think that's a really important piece to to um, highlight here. So this is not a randomized controlled trial. It's not a trial, and in fact, they do some really interesting um, analysis here. And in fact, we'll go ahead and jump into some of those pieces. They do what's called a mixed methods study. So they have their quantitative data collection and what they basically did was they did um, pain visual analog scales before and after treatments and so that was their uh, primary quantitative outcome but then they also um, at the end of the last massage session they got anywhere from one to three or four massages and at the end of their last session they also did a, um, a survey that asked some very specific questions. But then they also did uh, a qualitative aspect of the study and basically what they did is they um, offered the patients the opportunity to comment on their experience with massage, so just open-ended questions, but then they also did a retrospective chart review um, where they were able to look and see what the nurses may have written about uh, their experience with the patients after the massage and the, the effects that they saw. I really loved that aspect of it because mm -hmm. you know, if we're going to make a case that massage therapists can be useful in a hospital setting, boy, the people who are most, who are going to be impacted almost as much as the patients um, are the the people really with their feet on the ground there, and that's the nurses. Mm -hmm. And Nikki, you mentioned this was a descriptive study. I'm not sure if I've heard that term recently enough to feel familiar with it. What, is, what does that mean? Sure. So basically what they're doing is they're collecting a lot of data, and the main, the main um, product that they're intending to do with all this data is to describe what happened. Okay, got so it. So while there may be some statistics and inferential statistics included, for the most part, that's not the primary piece. It's more about describing it very richly. And you're able to do that with quantitative data as well, especially um, with the kind of data that they're collecting. So I mentioned again that, or maybe I haven't mentioned it yet, they're looking at one population and everybody um, who was enrolled in the study got the treatment. So in other words, they didn't compare the outcomes that these folks experienced to a group who either didn't receive treatment or, or who received a treatment that they want to uh, uh, compare yeah. the results against. And so we had a, I think it might have been the last perch that we did or, or maybe two perches ago, where we were really talking about the importance of having a comparison group. And while they do do paired t-tests in this study for the inferential statistics, they're simply comparing the same person before the treatment and after treatment. And they're making an assumption that any changes that happened was absolutely because of the massage. And but there's a lot of other variables that could have been happening here. And this and that's that's just a small problem with this kind of study. And, and it's not a huge problem. I mean, it's something that they talk about. There's not a comparison group, and that's fine. But we 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 can't point to the mechanism that is causing the effect from this particular study because it very well could have been that these um, people who were providing massage sessions were absolutely wonderful people. I'm sure they were absolutely wonderful people. <laughs> but we can't tease out that personal effect um, from these results. And so until you do a comparison of these folks' changes with somebody who still had a wonderful person coming in and giving them um, attention for that amount of time, to really be able to see what the true effect of massage is. But as we talk about these results a little bit more, um, I'll describe some different things that they that they could have done in this descriptive study to really um, pop the results a little bit more and do some division of, of, of different responders and non-responders and do some really effective exploratory comparative analysis. Well, i got to say, Nikki, you kind of bummed me out a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, <laughs> because, and, because I look at the... I look at the results here, and first of all, I looked at the results here, and I, I'm not shocked at all because the conclusion we've we've come to here in this study, uh, it says you know very clearly that um, uh, integration of massage therapy in the acute care setting creates overall positive results in the patient's ability to deal with challenging physical and uh, psychological aspects of their health condition. It dem demonstrates significant reduction in pain levels. So again, this doesn't shock me because. Um, I guess I would expect that. Maybe I'm just, you know, assuming something here. But, uh -huh. but that seemed to be the conclusion. But then, of course, you just kind of bum me out because you're like, well, you know, it could be related to massage, but there's so many other variables. So we don't. 
I guess, are you saying we don't really know definitively? Well, what, what we do know from this data is that when, when they did statistical analysis on the 53 folks that they have pre and post data for, mm -hmm. okay, basically what they're doing is they're looking at what that mean change score is. Okay, so the difference between pre and post, and they're testing to see if that difference, considering the standard deviation and all the variance between those things, is significantly different from zero, and in this case, or, or no change, okay, and in this case it is, and, well, and, that, wanna, and that is statistically significant. Go ahead, Ruth. Well, what I wanted to interject is, is what a control group would, have, would show us um, if we had that as a comparison. Uh -huh. is, is typically in a study like this, a control group also has some improvement. Um, and that's just the natural history um, yeah. of, of what happens with time as people are healing from whatever kind of, whatever kind of uh, problem brought them to the hospital in the first place. What we are really interested to see and what's going to give us information about um, both effectiveness and cost effectiveness is if there's a really uh, um, measurable, significant, statistically significant difference in the in the mean change scores between a massaged group and a not massaged group. Well, I guess why my question would be why didn't they use a control group? I mean, now, now that you describe it that way, it seems kind of obvious to me. Well, of course you'd want a control group for better data. So why didn't this happen? Well, there's a lot of reasons for it. And in fact, in the in the article, they say that to do to do a control group in, in a study such as this, especially with the kind of numbers that they have, and these are pretty big numbers. They actually started off with 65, yeah, yeah, 65 people to begin oh, yeah. with. Is that it's cost prohibitive um, in oh, some okay. instances. And so and so really, this is a great first step because yeah. what they what they are showing here is there is change that occurs with this massage, and it's positive change, okay? So the next step would be to now compare it to see if this change is significantly different from change that might happen from a, a different sort of treatment or um, versus standard care, so no treatment at all. And there's also some other just sort of fundamental problems with, um, and ch not problems, challenges in doing this kind of research and having a control group. And that is, hey, we'd like you to be involved in this research study. Would you agree to do it? You'll either get assigned to no massage or massage. And they say, oh, sure, I'll do that. And then they say, oh, <laughs> <I'll take massage. laughs> right. And they say, oh, no, you don't get to choose. Let's flip this coin, for example. Oh, you're in the control group. You don't get massage. Oh, I don't want to do that anymore. And then they yeah, and they may a psychological element that probably gets introduced to it as well that may affect the outcome anyway. Is that what absolutely, I'd... absolutely. So there's so there's all manner of different pieces of why you know these sorts of things are challenging. Now there's ways that you could certainly get around that. So for instance, you could have people who um, are on a weightless control. So then you have all these people who say yes, I'll be involved in the study, and half of the people get to have their massage that day, and the other half get to have the massage in a couple of days. Now you're going to lose some folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but then you, uh, and you could do like a crossover design so where everybody will still do it at this point and at that point, the, the pre and post, if you will. So, so there are, are ways to do that. But going back to this particular study, this is a really great first step. They've established several things. First, they've established that they could, um, that they can implement a kind of research study in this environment. So that's a really good important piece. The second piece is that they were able to get um, people to comply to the treatment and, and to do the pieces, right? People that would agree to do it. And they had some pretty, um, it looks like they were able to collect their data pretty well. Now, one of the one of the problems I have with this study is that there's not a whole lot of description of how that data was collected, and so it's really unclear as to how biased the data could be. So, basically, what was happening is the massage therapist. The way that I'm understanding it is the massage therapist was collecting the visual analog scale before and after the massage session, and there's an inherent problem with that. If if indeed the massage therapist is saying, "Here's this piece of paper. Draw a line on where your pain is." And then after the massage that they just got done applying, they're looking over their shoulder saying, where's your pain now? And there might be some, uh, you know, some unconscious pressure. Sure, yeah. they would, and they want to they they please the massage therapist. This person just got done doing this really nice massage. So, yeah, here's, here's where my pain is now. It's really regret. And so it might be a little inflated. But, but the, the, the point is, too, is that that may not be what happened. They very well may have done it blinded and they just didn't report it, which would have been ideal. So, for instance, there's a little chart that the massage therapist never even sees, and it's just, you know, they put it in an envelope and then that's just taken over to um, 
the non-massage therapist researcher, yeah, yeah, or the statistician or something. So that would have been ideal, and we don't know that from how they've reported this. So that's that's an unfortunate um, um, case from that. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes sense. I guess what I'm where my head goes is, you know, I uh, I always wonder what how does this what are the implications on how this affects the opportunities for massage therapists in a hospital setting? Can you can you pull anything out in terms of, of how this might affect massage therapists and their opportunities in that setting? Like at first I look at this and I say, you know, before you bum me out with all this data showing challenges with it, <laughs> I was thinking, well, gosh, this seems like very compelling because as a massage therapist, you could um, you could use this as maybe uh, just an example of, hey, massage therapy does have a place in you know pain management in a hospital setting, and maybe it's something you could bring up to you know hospital leadership or co you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, and that can has, still be done with this. Absolutely. Okay, so you think it has validity when it comes to um, introducing into a, a, I guess, a business setting or a, a clinical setting. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and here's the thing, too. A really savvy massage therapist who is going to do that would also bring into the discussion, and, and that's not a part of, of this particular article because this was published in 2010, okay? But now, with the Affordable Care Act um, being implemented, hospitals are being charged with and are, are part of the money that they're getting um, from federal money is attached to uh, patient reported satisfaction. Yes. Ooh. And yeah. one of the okay. things that this uh, uh, research is showing is the satisfaction that these folks had with their whole experience. Um, not just with their pain management but also the emotional pieces and some of these other qualitative things that they're that they're talking about. And so to not only be able to take this particular a bit of evidence to show how you know massage therapy can easily be integrated in, and these are from a, from as little as 15 minutes to 45 minutes, but that also people were really satisfied with this, and this is a way that um, can help you in this regard. So that's that's ah, that's, well, that's significant. I'm no longer bummed out. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Don't be bummed out. So, so the part that the part that gets bummy is because you know I put my critical researcher hat on and go, okay, you know, here's all the places and the next steps that need to happen, and here's the the little holes, and here's how the analysis uh, could have been done, or or the data could have been played with a little bit to be even more informative. That's where my critique comes in. But but overall, this is this is a a great piece the massage therapist can point to to show that it that it is effective. Now there are next steps with the research so we can get more um, unequivocal uh, uh, solid evidence with the comparison group and that will be important and I'm sure that that's coming. I don't, I, I, I did actually a quick um, Google Scholar search and PubMed search to see if they have published more on this or if they've done next step studies and I don't see anything yet. Ruth, do you know anything about these folks? No, I haven't heard a word. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully they've got some um, next steps happening. And if not, I think that this uh, particular study could be definitely used as a model um, for uh, other groups who may be interested in looking at massage therapy in acute care settings. Okay. Well, you know, and 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 one of the big questions that's that's often on my mind when I when I read studies about mas massage in hospital setting is. Um, Hospitals typically are reasonably enthusiastic about this because it improves their patient satisfaction scores. Yeah, and that's great. Patients love it, um, but it, it always becomes an issue about um, who's going to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? In other words, is this cost effective? And um, when I see, for instance, it's on. Uh, well, when I see. A, a bar chart that we see in this that that shows a significant difference in, um, for instance, how how much pain medication people needed after their treatments. Um, that's, that's a problematic thing, though, to point to Ruth in this one, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Go ahead. Okay. Look, look but, at our right. bar chart. but I would love us to gather more data about massage in you know for acute, in acute care settings and and overall medication use because that's. Mm -hmm. An extremely, first of all, it's expensive to begin with, but the mistakes that are made when people are, you know, when people don't use their medications correctly is a tremendously expensive um, uh, aspect of healthcare. And if, if massage can help people use fewer medications, we have much lower risk recovery periods, we have much lower risk of, of uh, uh, medication related uh, complications. Um, and I think when we're trying to make a case that it's 
it, you know, not only should massage be in hospitals, but massage therapists should be paid to be there and not not, not there solely as volunteers. Um, you know, that's the kind of data we need to we need to be collecting. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, and it's unclear how these paid. Huh? Yeah, well, and it's unclear how these folks were paid. They talk right. about that these are massage therapists who are employed by the hospital, employed by the hospital, which sort of insinuates that they're being paid. But nowhere does it say that these treatments were complementary, because that's one. That's another piece that sort of can muddy up. The, I assume that they were complementary, but um, that could also potentially muddy it up, right? So not only does that then limit who could who could have gotten it, but then also you know there's there's something about people who are compelled to pay for a service versus mm -hmm. they they choose on their own to pay for a service, and what those and how that could affect um, their self perceived outcomes. Right. Yeah. So, but um, you mentioned the uh, need for less pain medication mm -hmm. uh, and, and in this one in particular with this study and the problematic piece around this is that um, this was on self-reflection for the patients we're, t we're, we're, we're talking right. about this rather well, than not looking... necessarily actually what they used. Right. And so it's not actually looking at what the medical chart said and looking at if there were any uh, changes in the way that they were using it. But, but that's not to disqualify somebody thinking that, yeah, I didn't need less pain medications. And even if that's just what they would perceive they should have needed and well now they didn't, you know, didn't have less, or if they actually have been in the situation before and they knew they had to have more medications and after the massage they didn't, it's, it's, it's unclear um, the way that this data was collected and reported to know about that. But, but yeah. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, I was so glad that you pointed to the chart, Ruth, because we all know that the first thing that I like to do is I like to look at the figures, and I like uh, to look at the table. Right? I love these charts. love these tables. do. And this one has a really cool figure in it, and that's that figure one. And what this one does is it shows every um, visual analog scale line for all the people who um, did pre and post. Oh, that's what that. Yeah, that's what that is. And so the first dot over there on the left is each person's pre, and then the line connecting it to the one on the right is their post. So you can look at that immediately and see that a majority of these folks all had decreased pain. And you're there's also one able flat, and there's one that goes up, and everything yeah. else. Well, there's a couple of there's a couple of them that go up, but not very many. And in fact, that one that goes up, oh, well, I can't tell if that one's the one that has three or if that one above yeah, it has three. It's, on three. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to know. But, but what this does is it gives a really great visual representation of where everybody started at the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, but this also, what this also does is, is me and, and, and loving to play with data, what I really would have liked to have seen with these folks is actually taken this and divided it up into a, they could have done this a couple of different ways. They could have made um, a couple of groups, one uh, strong responders and those who weren't such strong responders, okay, and have all of those who, and now they, now you start looking at the percentage of change rather than the absolute value of change because even when you're looking at this chart, the person who started off at 10 mm -hmm. ended over here at about five and a half. Right. Okay. That, that is a 50% reduction for them. And that's, that's huge, but now the person that started up here at this eight and a half, that ended at just over eight, they, they started with pretty high pain, but from a percentage standpoint, they only decreased by maybe 1% or 5% or, or something like that. And so by looking at a percentage change, that gives you much more of an idea of, 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 the, of the quality of, and the, the magnitude of change for each individual person. So then, while it's, while it's interesting to look at mean pre and mean post and, and, and mean it's it's that mean change score, right? And that percentage change that is most interesting to me because it's it's relative to where you started. Okay. And so what they could have done was taken all the people who responded with twenty percent or even fifty percent reduction in their pain, took those folks and looked at them and looked at the folks who didn't and see if there's any differences in them. So one, if the differences oh, yeah. were their pre-pain, 
So those who started off with higher pain, um, or maybe who were more complicated patients, and you know that that leaves a whole another bag of worms of what means complicated. But what was the condition that they came in under? Not everybody had the same amount of treatments. Not everybody had the same um, duration of treatments. So you can actually look and see if some of these results um, were related to how long, how many minutes, total minutes they had with massage. You could look and see half of the people only had one session. So you could take those people, so this is another way that you could have divided it, taken all the people who only had one session and looked at what their results were versus okay. those who had multiple sessions and just look at that last session and mm -hmm. see if there was a compound effect. Does that make sense? Yeah. So those would be some really exciting things that this, that this study had the opportunity to do that unfortunately they didn't. That if, they're, if, they, if they listen to this, they still have this data, that's a whole other paper that they could put out that would be really, really informative. <laughs> well, you know, I know one of the editors at IJTMB, maybe, maybe they could, like, you know, send a note. <laughs> <laughs> you think you can make a call? You, you, know, you know some people? Solicit, <laughs> solicit an additional paper. <laughs> well, uh, this sounds like a great start. So um, I'm happy to hear, Nikki, that you may, kind of made the... Um, the statement that this does have validity in the, in oh, the absolutely. setting. I really appreciate that because it does seem very uh, promising. I mean, every massage therapist wants to hear validation that what they do makes an impact on people having challenges. So I really appreciate hearing that. So um, I think that's a, a good place to stop for now unless anything else we want to add for the moment. I just want to um, encourage people because I see people and people reach out and contact me from time to time as well about you know, who are interested in approaching their local hospital to talk about a massage program. Um, and, and this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of report that's really going to strengthen your argument as long as you know, you know, what the internal weaknesses are that are in the report as well, so you can sort of address those ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Nikki says, it's a really, really solid piece of work and um, can, it's something that can certainly be used to uh, um, help us begin those uh, conversations. Well, and I'd, and I'd also like to say too that their primary outcome measure here was very, very simple and one that everybody can use. A visual analog scale is so mm -hmm. simple and it's valid and it's interesting and that, you know, people who are interested in doing research and especially if they were approaching the hospital and hospitals have IRBs which are the people who you know say whether or not you can do and you know making sure that the ethics are all all, all good and safe. You don't have to be associated with a university necessarily if you have right. if you've been an in and like that. Right, and so if you're in the t if you you know approach a teaching hospital or any kind of hospital, you say you know there are research opportunities here. I could very easily gather the same sort of data and information if people in your hospital would be interested in looking at these pieces and, and, and publishing on it and there and and that's another piece and and to be able to you know I'm a really firm believer in using data such as this to help in your in your practice and if you have people outside of the hospital se se setting if you have people that are coming to you who have um, pain levels and they're coming for pain and they see you on a, on a for a long-term basis, you can chart these sorts of visual analog scales pre and post, and it can give really rich and interesting information to your to your clients, and and, and very effective pieces. And then you can also write up case reports and all <laughs> sorts of pieces. That and what is, fun that would be, <laughs> right? But it but it it makes it makes great. Um, it, it helps your practice. It helps research. It helps your field. And we, as massage therapists, have to be interested in more than just our immediate um, uh, practice that's right in front of us. Right. In, in my opinion, we have to we have to be interested in more than just the people that we see on our tables. That's a great point. Let's end on that note. Thank you, Nikki. Okay. Appreciate that. This is a it's a great bridge between the world of massage therapy and the the world of um, uh, the medical community. So I really appreciate that connection. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, thank you as well. Thank you both for all your insights. Uh, we unpacked a lot more than I expected, which is awesome. So uh, I encourage everyone who's listening to go uh, download the, uh, the article as well. It's in the 2010 edition of IJTMB. It's, practice, or it's uh, volume three, number one. Uh, it's at IJTMB.org. We'll have it linked on the blog post. So if you're watching, just look below. It's right there. Uh, if you're listening, just, uh, again, go to IJTMB.org. And if you search for... 
uh, acute care setting in the search box. That should pull it up uh, at the top there, so you'll be able to find it there. So as always, thank you for listening, and uh, thanks so much for uh, continuing to watch and listen to Research Perch. Uh, we're so glad to have you as, um, as part of our community. Uh, so again, thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, thanks, we'll Michael. see you next time. Thanks, Michael. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Research Perch. Please send feedback or questions to perch at massagetherapyfoundation.org. See you next time.